Hey everyone. In this video, I want to build on a video I actually did a few weeks ago, which was all about getting used to using PowerShell with Azure. And then the natural really progression was what about the AZ CLI? So in this video, I really want to talk about how we use the AZ CLI to actually interact and manage Azure. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated. So if we just take a really quick step back, as we always kind of talk about, we have Azure. And the whole point of Azure is we have this set of services that's built on the capacity that is distributed through all the various regions. So we have this great Azure service. And the way we interact with that is actually through the Azure Resource Manager arm. And this is actually a kind of REST API. So we think about, we use REST API calls, a RESTful call to actually interact with that Azure Resource Manager. And behind the scenes, all of this kind of metadata, the structure is stored as JSON. Now, through that REST API, we could talk directly. I can make REST API calls, but for most of us humans, that, that's not super friendly for us to work in. So there are other vehicles we can leverage. Now, there are things like the Azure portal. That is behind the scenes talking to that REST endpoint. There are things like the PowerShell, the AZ PowerShell module. And then, of course, we have this AZ CLI. All of these things are going via that RESTful API because there's different ways to interact and manage. Now, I do want to point out, yes, we can provision resources through all of these different things, through PowerShell, through the AZ CLI, through the portal. It's not the preferred way to actually provision things. I talked about kind of behind the scenes, this arm, everything is kind of structured as this kind of JSON. And we can actually use that directly. So we can use a declarative mechanism to provision resources. And so natively behind the scenes, we have kind of these Azure Resource Manager JSON files that enable us to say, well, hey, this is the resource we want. Go and make it so. And then what we really focus on today is this language called BICEP. So BICEP is this domain-specific language for Azure that behind the scenes goes and creates kind of the JSON and submits it to that RESTful endpoint, but we don't need to know it. We can write this much more friendly language for our declarative deployment. So that's really an aside. But if I do have these JSON templates uh, or this BICEP, I can still submit these files with my declarative configuration through things like the AZ CLI or that PowerShell module. So I can still use these declaratively and then deploy them via the REST endpoint through, for example, the AZ CLI. But it is using REST behind the scenes, and we can actually see that. So super quickly, if I just jump over to the code for a second, this first very simple command, all I'm doing is I'm running this command with dash dash debug. Now, AZ group list just shows me my resource groups. And I'm just gonna run this super fast and we can actually see, well, there's all the resource groups. We have that output. There's a whole bunch of stuff at the end. There's a whole bunch of stuff at the beginning. Now, all of this big, middle, ugly stuff, this is actually the response. You can see, hey, look, response content, here's the value, is all JSON. So what happens is the AZ group list commands gets this big response, it parses it, and in my case, I said output as a table. By default, it would output it as JSON, just a bit nicer looking. So that's the response we get back because we are making a call to the RESTful endpoint. If we actually go and look, we can kind of see all of this stuff happening behind the scenes with that debug. But what we'll see is we'll find it actually go and kind of get a token. So we can see, hey, look, I'm using my access tokens over here in this file, this C users John access tokens.json. So that's it actually getting a token it can use. And today it's using ADAL. So ADAL. 
So that's the Azure um, Active Directory Authentication Library. Now it is going to move to MSAL, the Microsoft Authentication Library, but it's just not there yet in this version. So we can see it's getting the token, and then what it actually does is, well look, there's a URL that it's using. Hey, management.azure.com, go and get me the resource groups. And we can see it's actually using get over here. So it's just using that RESTful API. We don't see it ordinarily. We don't bother typing, hey, I want to see um, the JSON. But that's what these commands are doing. So when we're using AZ CLI, we're still going through that RESTful endpoint. Okay, so let's actually talk about how I can use the AZ CLI. How do I get it? Well, the first thing is, really exactly like the portal and the Azure PowerShell, well, the AZ CLI started off life as the cross-platform CLI. It was really designed around Linux when I couldn't use the PowerShell module. But everything has changed. So when I think about what well, can I use, well, I can use Windows. I can use Linux and I can use Mac OS, actually for all of these. So it's not like, well, PowerShell, I have to use Windows, AZ CLI, I have to use Linux, uh, the portal, whatever. All of these work for all of these. I can use the AZ CLI on Windows, on Linux, on Mac OS, as can I the PowerShell, which is also cross-platform with PowerShell 7, PowerShell 6, uh, the PowerShell core. So I have a choice, no matter what platform I'm using, I can use any of these methods. People more from a Linux background, used to kind of bash, for example, are probably gonna be more drawn to that Azure CLI. So if we jump over to the installation, we can see in the documentation, it talks about, hey look, how I can install on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, including the Windows subsystem for Linux, which runs on Windows. I can even install in a Docker container. So I have a massive ways to install. Now there might be shortcuts available. Sometimes it's, hey look, there's a, an MSI. But also, hey look, there's the MSI with a command. I can use the invoke web request to the kind of short link for the Azure CLI download, and then start a process to actually install it. So there's kind of this easy way to do that installation. Uh, likewise, on Mac, I can use Brew, for example, on the different Linux distributions, I have different ways to install it from there as well. So I have all these different methods to actually install the Azure CLI. But remember that Azure portal we talked about? Well, remember we have the Cloud Shell. So that icon up here, if I hit the Cloud Shell, we can see I've got currently it's set to Bash. So with the bash, now I don't have to log in. It's automatically logged in with me. I could just do an AZ VM list and I'll see my virtual machines. I don't have to authenticate first. I could actually do my AZ account show and I can see, hey, I'm actually authenticated as my user. The same user I'm in the portal, I am automatically have my token to use with this bash. But remember, even in here when it's bash, I can still do things like, well, I could access PowerShell. And then from here, I could actually go and use the AZ PowerShell module, get AZ VM, um, et cetera, et cetera. Because remember, this is all built actually on Linux. It's a Linux container. Now I can see, hey, I'm actually running Linux. So that's bash, you would expect that. But likewise for the Cloud Shell, I could change it to PowerShell and I'd have exactly the same AZ CLI option available to me. So here I'm in my PowerShell. Well, AZ VM list still works. And I can actually get to the shell also doing just the very easy shell.azure.com. And now I don't have the rest of the portal, I just have this shell instantly available to me. So we have these different ways of very, very quickly just getting to a terminal if we want to. And even things like the um, Azure app on your mobile device can get access to that cloud shell, so I can kind of get that easy access. 
So all of these things, when we talk about portal, it is important to realize that also includes kind of that cloud shell, which is a super easy way to get to those other things as well. So now let's actually think about, we have this, the AZ CLI installed. Great, it's available to me. There's probably new versions. So I can manually go and get the new version and do an upgrade. There's actually an easier way I can do that within the Azure CLI itself. So if we jump back over, the first thing I could do, for example, is I could check the current version. I could do AZ version. So I'm just gonna execute that command. We can see, hey, I'm running 2.21.0. To upgrade to the latest version, I can just do AZ upgrade. You can see here there's options around yes and all. And I'm running this in VS Code. I'm gonna talk more about that in a second. It's just a nice editing environment. But if I run AZ Upgrade, it's gonna do a check. And it's actually saying, hey, you're already running the latest version. There's nothing I need to do. It also, you'll notice, is checking the extensions as well. So if I look, one of the great things about the AZ CLI is there's a whole set of extensions that can add additional functionality to it. And often these will just say, hey, you need this extension, do you want me to automatically go and get it? There's also the ability to set an automatic upgrade. So if I go and get the configuration for my AZ CLI, you'll see here, I have this option for auto upgrade. And we can see in my environment, I have it set to enable yes, and prompt no. So every time I launch the AZ CLI, it's gonna go and do a check to see, hey look, is there a newer version? And it won't even prompt me. Now you can configure those by doing the AZ config set, auto upgrade dot enable equals yes, and auto upgrade dot prompt equals no. So if you just run those two commands, you'll get my configuration. So then every time it actually starts, it will go and do a check and upgrade if it needs to. Okay, outside of the cloud shell, which automatically logs me in, I have to authenticate. So by default, if I just run AZ login, it's gonna integrate with the local browser and use that to authenticate. So if I just run this right now, you'll notice it opened up a browser. I didn't have to type in a code or do anything else. And it's saying, hey, which account via the browser do you want to authenticate with? I'm just saying, hey, my current user, you have logged in. And I will redirect you back to the AZ CLI. I can close that. I don't really need it anymore. Close that as well. And I can now see it did that authentication. If I just go down, I am authenticated. You can see here it's using my current subscription. Now, suppose I have an environment where I don't have a local browser. I can also use the device code option. So what this will actually do is, this was kind of how it used to work. It will give me a code and say, go to this website and type in the code. So now that browser could be local to a, a different machine and I would just type in the code. So if I do this execution, it's telling me, hey, open a browser on this page and then enter this code. So if I copy that and then go to this page, I have to type in that code. Okay. Now I will tell it what account to use. And now I'm authenticated. But you see that could be from a completely different browser than where the AZ CLI was actually running. That's the whole point of that. So now I've authenticated. Now in this case, when I authenticate, what it's actually doing is also getting a list of all of the subscriptions. It's gonna call ARM and PARS to see what subscriptions are available and also give me access to a certain subscription. Imagine I want to authenticate against a tenant where there are no subscriptions. Maybe I just wanna do some AZ AD commands, for example. So I can do that. There's actually a special parameter where I can basically tell it, hey, allow with no subscriptions. 
So you could see up here, I can do this easy login, allow no subscriptions. And I could tell it a tenant where there are no subscriptions, and I would then be allowed to authenticate. And what would happen is essentially it'd be a tenant only um, account. Now account means something very different in CLI than like Azure AD. It's like a context in PowerShell. And we're gonna talk more about that in just a second. But I can, if I need to, authenticate even where there are no subscriptions. Now suppose I'm a resource in Azure and it has a managed identity. Remember the whole point of a managed identity is up in Azure, I have some resource. Maybe it's a virtual machine, maybe it's a function, it doesn't matter, there's a resource there. Remember we have that Azure Active Directory. So up to this point, I've been authenticating with user accounts. But also these resources can be given this managed identity, which also exists in the Azure AD. And remember subscriptions trust a particular Azure AD tenant. So now within that resource, I can say, hey, I just wanna authenticate with the system assigned managed identity or a user assigned managed identity. I don't wanna to have to type anything. So if I jump over to here, so this is just a virtual machine running in Azure that has a managed identity. From here, all I have to do is AZ login dash dash identity, that's it. I don't have to say an account or anything else. And you can see here, the assigned identity info is an MSI. It shows me it down here at the bottom, it's an MSI. And I can see it was a system assigned identity. I didn't have to do anything else. So it just inherently could authenticate as that identity. Now there's gonna be other scenarios, close that down. It might be I have um, an application on premises, for example. Maybe I've got some application over here. Well, I still have to be able to authenticate. So that's when we use something called a service principle. So once again, this service principle is an account up in the Azure AD, and that requires either a secret, so a secret is essentially a password, or it needs a certificate. And that's what it would use to authenticate to Azure AD to then get access. I'm not gonna go into detail on that here. I did a video a couple of weeks ago on unattended authentication to Azure. Um, I used PowerShell for a lot of the examples, but exactly the same content around managed identity and service principles, both secret and cert apply. So go and check that out for more detail on how I can authenticate with kind of service principles from the AZCLI. The same thing applies, but essentially from a command perspective, I would just use this kind of AZ login service principle, user, password, and tenant. Or instead of a password, it could be a certificate. And one of the nice things actually about the AZCLI, if I wanna create a new service principle, it actually has this AZAD service principle create for RBAC option. I just give it a name. Now today, it will automatically make it a contributor of the default subscription. I can instead do dash dash roll to give it a more constrained set of permissions. And I think from the documentation, it's saying in the future, they're actually gonna remove that contributor by default. And I will actually have to tell it a particular role if I want to give it something. So that is gonna change in the future. Now I mentioned something. I talked about account and I said context and I said it was kind of confusing. In the AZ CLI, you'll see account used a lot. That does not mean an account as in an account in Azure AD, and this is unfortunate. So in PowerShell, we have the concept of a context. Now a context is really about, hey, what is kind of my working environment? The credential I use to authenticate, the tenant, the subscription, so that is a context. In the AZ CLI, that is called an account, and it's ugly, and it's very unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So if I think about a PowerShell context, well, that is equal to a CLI, an AZ CLI account. 
So do not let that term account confuse you. It really is just this combination of kind of that, um, I'm not gonna say account, we say the credential we use to authenticate, um, kind of the tenant, and kind of the subscription if it's not a tenant only context or account. So you'll see the word account, it doesn't mean account like a user account, it means context, i.e. the combination of my credential I've used to authenticate, the tenant and the subscription. So we can actually see those. So if we jump back over again, if I go and look at my environment, so I've already authenticated at this point, and I've got kind of an example in here. If you have authenticated, I can then easily go and get tokens, bearer tokens I can use for RESTful calls. For example, if I wanted to go and talk to Azure Key Vault, I've got an example of just getting a token through my current authentication context for the Azure Key Vault. So that would just actually go and, hey, get me a token. And then if I actually looked at token, that's my bearer token I could use. The good news is you don't even have to do that. I can do the az rest command, and I can use whatever method, be it put or get or post, and give it the URL. So here, for example, I don't even have to manually go and get a token first. It will do the work for me. It will construct that request for me. I'm just telling it, hey, I want you to call this RESTful method for me. And it will take care of getting the token and doing everything else, and there's my result. It went and got information about a particular resource group for me. It went and got the required token. It went and did that, and it went and passed the response and outputted it in this more friendly JSON format. So that's just a few little niceties I want to put in there. If you ever have to do something where you can't directly use AZ CLI, and I have to use a RESTful endpoint. Because remember, I'm kind of drawing this picture, when there's brand, brand new functionality, often it's available via that REST first, and then it comes to things like the AZ CLI and AZ PowerShell. So if it's something brand new, I might need to do a RESTful call to actually leverage it, and then it will show up in the CLI, then it will show up in PowerShell. So that's why that can be useful to know how to call a RESTful um, API, because maybe I, I can't natively use PowerShell or CLI yet. So that's those context things. So if we actually look, um, I'm authenticated, I can do an AZ account show. So again, we're using the account word, which normally would be confusing, but now we understand well, that's just a context. Account equals context in PowerShell terms. So if I run that, well, I can see, hey, look, my current environment is Azure Commercial Cloud. That would make sense. I can see my current subscription. And I can see my tenant ID for my SavileTech.net. And I can see my current user. So that is my current context, my credential, my tenant, the subscription I'm working in. Now, there may be other subscriptions, other contexts that I've used in the past. So I can do an AZ account list. Now, by default, this would output in JSON format. Everything is JSON in the AZ CLI. So you'll often see me do dash dash output table to just make it more readable. I could do an abbreviation dash O space table instead as well. So here I can see I actually have other contexts available to me, other combinations of account, subscription, etc. So I could change to this. I can do AZ account set and the subscription name. Now I'm already running this one. You could see, hey, I could jump over and I could actually go and now use that particular subscription. I could also use that abbreviation and do dash S, which is the same as dash dash subscription. So that's how I can kind of work with the context. So realize account is not actually an Azure AD account. It is just this friendlier way of doing things. Now, before I go any further, you've noticed now when I hover over things, it gives me this help. That's, that's nice and friendly. If I'm outside VS Code, you're not getting that. If I start typing commands like az v, now it's not gonna do it because I'm trying to demo it, <laughs> but ordinarily it would like giving me autocomplete. It would like show me the options available. Hey, az vm list, 
it would be showing things actually as I'm typing. I've actually had some weird, um, doesn't always work funnily enough. Let's try and type something further up here. Maybe it's just falling asleep. No, nope, it's not doing it. It would normally give me that IntelliSense. Now you can also see though, it is showing me down the bottom here, my subscription is Savile Tech Dev Subscription, so it's showing me that as well. And this is all actually lit up by VS Code and a particular extension. So what we want to do is install this Azure CLI Tools extension, which I've got, and that adds a number of things. So we can see, and it was working, IntelliSense for commands and the arguments. I can get snippets. I can actually run the current command, which is what you've seen me do. I'm pushing control and single quote, and it runs the current command. It gives me that documentation on mouse hover. And then it shows the subscription and defaults in the status bar. Now you just need to make sure when you're doing the editing, make sure you're saving it as an .az CLI file. Now what I'm gonna do is just super quickly, let's try something. Let's just reopen it. I would like you to kind of be able to see that. So if I see if now if we opened it, AZ, VM, no, it's still not doing it. Oh, there we go. So now it's working again. It's a bit temperamental. But you can see now it's giving me that kind of IntelliSense of what I might want to do. And then it's showing me, hey, the parameters. So it's showing that IntelliSense actually as I'm leveraging it. But it does seem there's something going on. It does seem to stop working after a while. I'm not quite sure why, um, but it does. So use that environment, it gives me this really nice environment to actually work in through the VS Code, but again, save it as a .az CLI file. So let's just start looking at some other things. Um, I can do dash H if I need help. So I know it's AZ group, and then I'm not sure what else to do, so I'm doing control single quote to run the current line. And then we can see, hey, um, okay, AZ group, uh, I, there's lock, create, delete, exists, export, list, and I can run those commands. I'm not sure how to use the list. Okay, I'll do AZ group list help. Okay, well there's some help on how I can use that. And remember, by default, if I do nothing else, if I just actually run, let's clear this for a second, AZ group list, the commands are always going to be this JSON output. But I can change it. I can say actually output as a table, okay. But I can also say, hey, output it as JSON, but I want color JSON, okay, it's fancy. So now I get this colorized JSON. I could output it as YAML or, or uh, tab separated values. So I have all these different options available to me. But I can change the output it's using to display to screen, but it's still always getting it as JSON from that RESTful endpoint is making that call to. Hey, I wanna create a virtual machine. Give me some help on that, okay? And there's some examples, AZ, VM, create, etc. And this is kind of the simplest command in the world I could use to create a virtual machine. Just a name, a resource group, and an image, and it would go and create that. I can go and get information. Hey, what VM size is available in South Central US? output it as a table. Well, here we go. Here's all the sizes available in South Central US. I can easily get that. And again, outputting as a table, but it does come over as JSON. Show me all the SKUs related to virtual machines. And there's gonna be quite a lot of those, because remember, for a VM, there's things like snapshots, there's disks, there's other elements, availability sets, other things that are actually part of what we consider VMs. I can see all of that information, host groups, snapshots, disks, availability sets. So if all these different things coming over in this nice table format. Because it's coming over as JSON though, I can actually search it. I can use the JMES path query format to actually query the JSON. So here I'm saying, hey look, I want to query all of the groups, query the location attribute, it has to equal South Central, and then output in a table, okay? So I can query. So I'm just saying a question mark, I want to run this query, and the location 
has to equal South Central US. So it's running that against all of those elements, hopefully, <laughs> and then it will actually output it as a table. I think that's done something funny. Let's try that again, yes. Go away. Try that one more time. So we run this command. And that should return, there we go, all of the resource groups in South Central US. Likewise, I can use more advanced things. Hey, the name starts with RG dash, output as a table. So we could run that. So I have all this flexibility because it's coming over as JSON, I can use a lot of different things to actually go and interact with it. So there's a lot of power I have available to me to actually streamline and modify the output of actually what we're getting. Try that again. Okay, so there we go, that works. It starts with RG dash. So I have these abilities to go and interact with it. Now I can also change, well, how it outputs that data. I can substitute attribute names for other attribute names. Like if I do an AZVM list, if I just do AZVM list, it's gonna give me the JSON. And there's a mass of information here. But you can see some elements are kind of embedded in child objects. Like there's an OS disk. Well, that OS disk is actually part of, scroll up, an storage profile. So there's the OS disk. So that's part of storage profile. And under that OS disk, there's actually an OS type over here. So it's really buried down. So that's super hard for me to actually see and interact with. So what I can actually do is you see this command here, I'm saying, look, I wanna query the output and what the two square brackets mean is, hey, there's an array of items coming back and I want to substitute the name attribute to be called uppercase name. But here, I wanna substitute that great big storage profile dot OS, this dot OS type to just be called OS. And the OS profile dot admin username I want to just replace to be called admin. And then for all of that, output it as a table. So if I run that, well, that's a lot more pleasant. So you can do some really nice things with this to get the data in kind of exactly the format you want to just really make it useful. Now, so far I've been running these various commands. I've been doing, okay, AZ, VM, list, and there's standard sort of list and create and commands, but how do I know what command I actually need to run? What, what if I don't know what I'm actually looking for? So there's some great ways we can actually find the various commands. So we can see here, first thing I'm gonna add an extension, this AZ extension add next. So I'm just gonna run that command and it's saying it's already installed. And once again, remember, we can look at the extensions we have. I can use something called AZ find. Now this is using AI, artificial intelligence, to actually assist us. So AZ find VM. And here it's saying the most common ways to use a VM. Hey, look, I can get a virtual machine. Here it's actually using a rest call. I can list all the virtual machines. Um, I can get a particular virtual machine. Okay, maybe I wanna create a disk. So I can use AZ find create disk. I don't know how to create a disk. If I run that, well, okay, here are some useful commands. AZ disk create dash dash name. Hey, that, that's what I wanted. That's my blob your eye. Maybe it's an empty disk. So it's actually giving me help based on what I tell it. I can just say, look, I'm trying to do this, Please help. And AZ find will help me find the right command. AZ next, that thing we just installed, well again, that's using AI and kind of machine learning to say based on what I've currently done, this is what you'd likely want to do next. Now I didn't do anything yet. So what I'm gonna do quickly is just create a new resource group. So I've done something. And now I'll ask AZ next again. 
And it's saying, well, based on what you've done, created a resource group, this is fairly common sets of next steps. Maybe you want to create a storage account. If I scroll up, create a storage account down here. That's option one. Or create a virtual machine scale set. Or create an Azure Container Registry. Or maybe set a subscription to be the current active. Create a load balancing rule. Or hey, if it's none of those, I can just hit zero and kind of move on. But the whole point of this is it helps me <coughs> maybe understand what my next step would probably be. And then if I wanted to kind of clear up, so I just create a resource group I don't want, and I'm just doing this to show you, hey, I can use that same query of the JSON. So I'm doing an AZ group list, which would return all of them. And I just want to find my current one, the one I just created that RG10. I say, oh, yep, it did create it. And then I'm going to delete it. Are you sure? Yes, I am and go and delete it. So that's all great. You're, you're seeing those things and that some of that autocomplete is great within that AZ CLI. But what if I want even more help potentially? So there's another way I can actually use the AZ CLI. And it's actually called this AZ Interactive. And it's giving me this this is full environment to actually run AZ CLI commands. Now I can run it within VS Code, or I could just really run it anywhere else. So if we actually quickly just open up, I don't know if I even have um, terminal installed on this box, let's see. Oh, I do, okay. So if I just open up terminal, for example, let's make this a bit bigger. There we go. So I can run AZ Interactive. So it's actually, here it's saying on this machine, you don't have that extension. So notice it's going to go and automatically install the extension. I can push enter to clean that up. So now it's showing me some basic information at the bottom. But I can just start typing VM. And it's saying, oh, these are the commands available as part of VM. And it's telling me, hey, this is going to manage Linux or Windows virtual machines. I can start typing. It's showing me the options available. Hey, this will list all VMs, list all VMs by resource group. So it's helping me run the various things. And then kind of there's that output from it. So it's given me this kind of nice immersive environment in which I, I can actually start interacting. So it's given me that uh, IntelliSense, that autocomplete, but it can even do more than that. So I wanted to show you kind of that just in a, a regular, any window I want. I'm going to control D to exit that quickly. And let's hop back over. So over to here, so if I run my AZ Interactive again. So I can run it from within VS Code. It's going to be just fine. And what I'm going to walk through now is remember I had the idea that, notice that I don't have to type AZ first. I can just start typing, and it shows me those commands. Because right now, I'm at the root kind of level of AZ. Suppose I was going to run a whole bunch of commands all around virtual machines. I don't want to keep typing VM. Well, I can do percent percent VM, push enter. Now notice what's happened to my default scope. My default scope is now VM. So now I can just type list, and I don't have to do anything else. And I can move up another layer. Maybe I now want to do VM images. So I can just now make that my default. I don't actually think I have any. Oh, there we go. I do have, there's some images there. Oh, these are from the marketplace, that's why. So I can see a whole bunch of images are available to me. So I can interact. I can move up one level. So I can go back up to just VM. Or I can go to the root by just typing percent percent. So it's going to unscope everything, take me back to that kind of bottom level. Another nice thing this does for me. Let's say I do run a command. So let's say, for example, I do that VM list. Remember, it returns a whole bunch of JSON to me. I can do question mark, question mark to get that JSON from the pre previous command again. And I can keep doing it. It's always going to have that JSON there. I can now use that in the next command. So what I'm doing in this command here is I'm saying, look, VM show the name question mark, question mark. So remember, that's the previous JSON. 
Now that was an array. There was only one in it, but it was still an array. So I'm saying the first item in the array, item zero, and I just want the name attribute. So I'm passing the name attribute from the first item in the array of the previous command I ran into the name argument of this VM show command. I'm also then passing the resource group attribute from the first item in the array of the previous command I ran to the resource group attribute of this command. So essentially I'm saying, hey look, the first item from that previous command pass in as the name and resource group value for a VM show. So if I execute that, get the details of the VM, push enter, there we go. Actually, it's confusing it. I'm just going to take that out. <laughs> Let's take that out for a second. Put that there. Now, if we just run this command again, and there we go. Because it went and got that virtual machine. And again, it's the same output, but all I'm really trying to demonstrate is the fact that, hey, I, I can take particular values from the previous command and it works. So I'm actually pulling out that first item in the array to attributes to pass into the next command. So that AZ Interactive is a really nice environment, but again, it gives me those great things like that IntelliSense. As I'm typing things, I can see the various options and commands I can do. It, it's just a very nice environment as maybe I'm maybe experimenting, I'm trying to learn, I'm not sure what commands are available. So it just gives me an easier way um, to actually interact. One of the things I actually forgot to mention earlier on, and I just kind of skipped over it, is remember we did kind of this output as the various formats? You can actually set defaults. So if you do AZ configure, it'll actually show me my current configuration. If I want to change my settings, it will ask me what is my default output format. So right now it's JSON. If I wanted, I could change it to table, for example, or whatever I want to do here. Again, I'm not going to change any of these things, but you can go and modify those defaults if you wanted to um, through that AZ configure command. So I just kind of wanted to point that out, kind of an important thing. And that's really it. So that was my goal. I really just wanted to walk through some of the basics of the AZ CLI, some of the ways you can kind of customize uh, that environment, some of the tooling, like that extension for VS Code, using that AZ Interactive and some of the other options it adds for you. But it, it's super powerful. I'm actually seeing some of the newer functionality showing up in the AZ CLI before. It's actually showing up in the AZ PowerShell module. Today, it is using that Azure AD authentication library, but it is moving to the Microsoft authentication library longer term. And I think when that happens, we'll see maybe a convergence of the tokens and the context between PowerShell and the CLI. But today, they're separate. Um, but that was it. So I hope that was useful. Uh, good luck in your AZ CLI endeavors.